Chapter Five, Part Two, of the Shadow Line: A Confession by Joseph Conrad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Five, Part Two. For myself, neither my soul was highly tempered nor my imagination properly under control. There were moments when I felt not only that I would go mad, but that I had gone mad already so that I dared not open my lips for fear of betraying myself by some insane shriek. Luckily I had only orders to give, and an order has a steadying influence upon him who has to give it. Moreover, the seaman, the officer of the watch, in me was sufficiently sane. I was like a mad carpenter making a box. Were he ever so convinced that he was king of Jerusalem, the box he would make would be a sane box." What I feared was a shrill note escaping me involuntarily and upsetting my balance. Luckily, again, there was no necessity to raise one's voice. The brooding stillness of the world seemed sensitive to the slightest sound like a whispering gallery. The conversational tone would almost carry a word from one end of the ship to the other. The terrible thing was that the only voice that I ever heard was my own. At night especially it reverberated very lonely amongst the plains of the unstirring sails. Mr. Burns, still keeping to his bed with that air of secret determination, was moved to grumble at many things. Our interviews were short five-minute affairs, but fairly frequent. I was everlastingly diving down below to get a light, though I did not consume much tobacco at that time. The pipe was always going out for in truth my mind was not composed enough to enable me to get a decent smoke. Likewise, for most of the time during the twenty-four hours, I could have struck matches on deck and held them aloft till the flame burnt my fingers, but I always used to run below. It was a change. It was the only break in the incessant strain, and, of course, Mr. Burns through the open door could see me come in and go out every time. With his knees gathered up under his chin and staring with his greenish eyes over them, he was a weird figure, and with my knowledge of the crazy notion in his head, not a very attractive one for me. Still, I had to speak to him now and then, and one day he complained that the ship was very silent. For hours and hours, he said, he was lying there, not hearing a sound, till he did not know what to do with himself. When Ransom happens to be forward in his galley, everything's so still that one might think everybody in the ship was dead, he grumbled. The only voice I do hear sometimes is yours, sir and that isn't enough to cheer me up. What's the matter with the men? Isn't there one left that can sing out at the ropes? Not one, Mr. Burns, I said. There is no breath to spare on board this ship for that. Are you aware that there are times when I can't muster more than three hands to do anything? He asked swiftly but fearfully, Nobody dead yet, sir? No. It wouldn't do, Mr. Burns declared forcibly. Mustn't let him. If he gets hold of one, he will get them all. I cried out angrily at this. I believe I even swore at the disturbing effect of these words. They attacked all the self-possession that was left to me. In my endless vigil in the face of the enemy, I had been haunted by gruesome images enough. I had had visions of a ship drifting in calms and swinging in light airs, with all her crew dying slowly about her decks. Such things had been known to happen. Mr. Burns met my outburst by a mysterious silence. Look here, I said. You don't believe yourself what you say. You can't. It's impossible. It isn't the sort of thing I have a right to expect from you. My position's bad enough without being worried with your silly fancies. He remained unmoved. On account of the way in which the light fell on his head, I could not be sure whether he had smiled faintly or not. I changed my tone. Listen, I said. It's getting so desperate that I had thought for a moment, since we can't make our way south, whether I wouldn't try to steer west and make an attempt to reach the mailboat track. We could always get some quinine from her, at least. What do you think? He cried out, No, no, no! Don't do that, sir. You mustn't for a moment give up facing that old ruffian. If you do, he will get the upper hand of us. I left him. He was impossible. It was like a case of possession. His protest, however, was essentially quite sound. As a matter of fact, my notion of heading out west on the chance of sighting a problematical steamer could not bear calm examination. On the side where we were, we had enough wind, at least from time to time, to struggle on towards the south, enough at least to keep hope alive. 
but suppose that i had used those capricious gusts of wind to sail away to the westward into some region where there was not a breath of air for days on end what then perhaps my appalling vision of a ship floating with a dead crew would become a reality for the discovery weeks afterwards by some horror-stricken mariners that afternoon ransom brought me up a cup of tea and while waiting there tray in hand he remarked in the exactly right tone of sympathy you are holding out well sir yes i said you and i seem to have been forgotten forgotten sir yes by the fever devil who has got on board this ship i said ransom gave me one of his attractive intelligent quick glances and went away with the tray it occurred to me that i had been talking somewhat in mr burns's manner it annoyed me yet often in darker moments i forgot myself into an attitude towards our troubles more fit for a contest against a living enemy yes the fever devil had not laid his hand yet either on ransom or on me but he might at any time it was one of those thoughts one had to fight down keep at arm's length at any cost it was unbearable to contemplate the possibility of ransom the housekeeper of the ship being laid low and what would happen to my command if i got knocked over with mr burns too weak to stand without holding on to his bed-place and the second mate reduced to a state of permanent imbecility it was impossible to imagine or rather it was only too easy to imagine i was alone on the poop the ship having no steerage way i had sent the helmsman away to sit down or lie down somewhere in the shade the men's strength was so reduced that all unnecessary calls on it had to be avoided it was the austere gambrel with the grisly beard he went away readily enough but he was so weakened by repeated bouts of fever poor fellow that in order to get down the poop ladder he had to turn sideways and hang on with both hands to the brass rail it was just simply heartbreaking to watch yet he was neither very much worse nor much better than most of the half-dozen miserable victims i could muster up on deck it was a terribly lifeless afternoon for several days in succession low clouds had appeared in the distance white masses with dark convolutions resting on the water motionless almost solid and yet all the time changing their aspect subtly towards evening they vanished as a rule but this day they awaited the setting sun which glowed and smouldered sulkily amongst them before it sank down the punctual and wearisome stars reappeared over our mastheads but the air remained stagnant and oppressive the unfailing ransom lighted the binnacle lamps and glided all shadowy up to me will you go down and try to eat something sir he suggested his low voice startled me i had been standing looking out over the rail saying nothing feeling nothing not even the weariness of my limbs overcome by the evil spell ransom i asked abruptly how long have i been on deck i am losing the notion of time fourteen days sir he said it was a fortnight last monday since we left the anchorage his equable voice sounded mournful somehow he waited a bit then added it's the first time that it looks as if we were to have some rain i noticed then the broad shadow on the horizon extinguishing the low stars completely while those overhead when i looked up seemed to shine down on us through a veil of smoke how it got there how it had crept up so high i couldn't say it had an ominous appearance the air did not stir at a renewed invitation from ransom i did go down into the cabin to in his words try and eat something i don't know that the trial was very successful i suppose at that period i did exist on food in the usual way but the memory is now that in those days life was sustained on invincible anguish as a sort of infernal stimulant exciting and consuming at the same time it's the only period of my life in which i attempted to keep a diary no not the only one years later in conditions of moral isolation i did put down on paper the thoughts and events of a score of days but this was the first time i don't remember how it came about or how the pocket-book and the pencil came into my hands it's inconceivable that i should have looked for them on purpose i suppose they saved me from the crazy trick of talking to myself strangely enough in both cases i took to that sort of thing in circumstances in which i did not expect in colloquial phrase to come out of it neither could i expect the record to outlast me 
This shows that it was purely a personal need for intimate relief and not a call of egotism. Here I must give another sample of it, a few detached lines, now looking very ghostly to my own eyes, out of the part scribbled that very evening. There is something going on in the sky like a decomposition, like a corruption of the air, which remains as still as ever. After all, more clouds which may or may not hold wind or rain. Strange that it should trouble me so. I feel as if all my sins had found me out. But I suppose the trouble is that the ship is still lying motionless, not under command, and that I have nothing to do to keep my imagination from running wild amongst the disastrous images of the worst that may befall us. What's going to happen? Probably nothing, or anything. It may be a furious squall coming, but and foremost, and on deck there are five men with the vitality and the strength of, say, two. We may have all our sails blown away. Every stitch of canvas has been on her since we broke ground at the mouth of the Maynam fifteen days ago, or fifteen centuries. It seems to me that all my life before that momentous day is infinitely remote, a fading memory of light-hearted youth, something on the other side of a shadow. Yes, sails may very well be blown away, and that would be like a death sentence on the men. We haven't strength enough on board to bend another suit. Incredible thought, but it is true. Or we may even get dismasted. Ships have been dismasted in squalls simply because they weren't handled quick enough, and we have no power to whirl the yards around. It's like being bound hand and foot, preparatory to having one's throat cut. And what appalls me most of all is that I shrink from going on deck to face it. It's due to the ship, it's due to the men who are there on deck, some of them ready to put out the last remnant of their strength at a word from me. And I am shrinking from it, from the mere vision, my first command. Now I understand that strange sense of insecurity in my past. I always suspected that I might be no good, and here is proof positive. I am shirking it. I am no good. At that moment, or perhaps the moment after, I became aware of Ransom standing in the cabin. Something in his expression startled me. It had a meaning which I could not make out. I exclaimed, Somebody's dead. It was his turn then to look startled. Dead? Not that I know of, sir. I had been in the forecastle only ten minutes ago, and there was no dead man there then. You did give me a scare, I said. His voice was extremely pleasant to listen to. He explained that he had come down below to close Mr. Burns's port in case it should come on to rain. He did not know that I was in the cabin, he added. How does it look outside, I asked him. Very black indeed, sir. There is something in it for certain. In what quarter? All round, sir. I repeated idly, all round, for certain, with my elbows on the table. Ransom lingered in the cabin as if he had something to do there but hesitated about doing it. I said suddenly, You think I ought to be on deck? He answered at once, but without any particular emphasis or accent. I do, sir. I got to my feet briskly, and he made way for me to go out. As I passed through the lobby, I heard Mr. Burns's voice saying, Shut the door of my room, will you, steward? And Ransom's rather surprised, Certainly, sir. I thought that all my feelings had been dulled into complete indifference but I found it as trying as ever to be on deck. The impenetrable blackness beset the ship so close that it seemed that by thrusting one's hand over the side one could touch some unearthly substance. There was in it an effect of inconceivable terror and of inexpressible mystery. The few stars overhead shed a dim light upon the ship alone, with no gleams of any kind upon the water, in detached shafts piercing an atmosphere which had turned to soot. It was something I had never seen before, giving no hint of the direction from which any change would come, the closing in of a menace from all sides. There was still no man at the helm. The immobility of all things was perfect. If the air had turned black, the sea, for all I knew, might have turned solid. It was no good looking in any direction, watching for any sign, speculating upon the nearness of the moment. When the time came, the blackness would overwhelm silently the bit of starlight falling upon the ship, and the end of all things would come without a sigh, stir, or murmur of any kind, and all our hearts would cease to beat like run-down clocks. It was impossible to shake off that sense of finality. The quietness that came over me was like a foretaste of annihilation. 
It gave me a sort of comfort, as though my soul had become suddenly reconciled to an eternity of blind stillness. The seaman's instinct alone survived whole in my moral dissolution. I descended the ladder to the quarter deck. The starlight seemed to die out before reaching that spot, but when I asked quietly, Are you there, men? My eyes made out shadowy forms starting up around me, very few, very indistinct, and a voice spoke, All here, sir. Another amended anxiously, All that are any good for anything, sir. Both voices were very quiet and unringing, without any special character of readiness or discouragement, very matter-of-fact voices. We must try to haul this mainsail close up, I said. The shadows swayed away from me without a word. Those men were the ghosts of themselves, and their weight on a rope could be no more than the weight of a bunch of ghosts. Indeed, if ever a sail was hauled up by sheer spiritual strength, it must have been that sail, for properly speaking there was not muscle enough for the task in the whole ship, let alone the miserable lot of us on deck. Of course I took the lead in the work myself. They wandered feebly after me from rope to rope, stumbling and panting. They toiled like titans. We were an hour at it, at least, and all the time the black universe made no sound. When the last leech line was made fast, my eyes, accustomed to the darkness, made out the shapes of exhausted men drooping over the rails, collapsed on hatches. One hung over the after capstan, sobbing for breath, and I stood amongst them like a tower of strength, impervious to disease and feeling only the sickness of my soul. I waited for some time, fighting against the weight of my sins, against my sense of unworthiness, and then I said, Now, men, we'll go aft and square the mainyard. That's about all we can do for the ship, and for the rest she must take her chance. End of chapter 5 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine